How many enjoyed Pentecost Sunday's word? Yeah, I had so much to say that I said, you know what? We're going to take a few Wednesdays and really break this thing down. And then we'll get back to the tabernacle as we begin to close it out for the summer. So go ahead, take your seats. Just a few announcements real quick. Number one, um, for those that may jump off early, the dig is closing out. We only have a few spots left. So if you're registering, register quick. Also on Sunday night at midnight, there will be a price jump because our team is ordering everything and they're going to be running around. So I want to bless them if they're having to run around at the last minute. So make sure you register for those giving. Uh, all of the giving right now outside of the bills is going towards backpacks for the summer. How many believe that if you sow into a child's education, they will grow into something amazing? So when we go out and we, we sow into the community's backpacks full of school supplies, we are showing these children in the communities that we believe in their education. So when we send the kids back to school with everything they need, the other thing is it allows them to start on track and not have to play catch up. So your giving makes that happen. So uh, as you give throughout the service or towards the end when we collect the offering, just know that is where your giving is going. Amen. Amen. So on Sunday, we left off with the disciples in Acts 1-6 gathering Say that word gathering. 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 That's going to come full circle before we close out. They are gathering around Jesus and asking him questions before his ascension. He has been with them 40 days and now he's about to go home finally. And he's not leaving them empty handed. In just 10 days, the promise of the Holy Spirit will come, which he has talked about with them all throughout his ministry, calling him the advocate, the comforter, the one that will teach him all things, the one who has wisdom, the one who has power. He is not leaving them alone, but he will not presently be walking with them with his presence any longer. And I said on Sunday that you have to be careful when you say statements like, well, Jesus is always walking with me. Jesus is not always walking with any of us. Jesus, the Bible says, was seated on the right hand of the Father when he ascended. So who is walking with us? Who is leading us? Who is talking to us? It is the Holy Spirit. He is to us what Jesus was to the twelve. So if you do not develop your relationship with the Holy Spirit and you act like, and he is not an it, a thing. Sometimes people will say, I got it. No, he is a person. So imagine somebody saying, I brought it with me to the party. He is a person. He is no different than God the Father or Jesus Christ. He is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. In Genesis, when God said, let us make man in our image, us, us. Us. Who is us? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Man is made triune because God is triune. So Jesus would send the Holy Spirit. And as the song just said, this is when the glory came down. Everywhere you go, glory is inside of you because glory came down on the day of Pentecost. But they are gathering and having almost a farewell party with Jesus. They are asking him questions about the kingdom, and I'm not going to get back into that. Listen to Sunday's message, and we, we really broke down that. But when Jesus would leave, he gave them a commandment to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. He gave them 10 days, 10 days, till Pentecost. He was with them 40. He will give them 10 days to get things in order. 10 days. Now, there is a lot in the 10 days that we could unpack, one being 10 is the number of the law. Whenever you see the number 10 in the Bible, it points to the law. So why is Jesus leaving them 10 days? He could have left on day 39. He could have left on day 38. Why is he giving them 10 days? Well, 10 is the fulfillment of the law. And he's showing them that the law was always supposed to point to the Holy Spirit coming and putting the law in our hearts. 
So now you don't need people to bash you over the head with the Ten Commandments. Once you give your life to Jesus, the Ten Commandments, in a way, get engraved on your heart. And that's what we call conviction. It's when you start to wrestle and you start to say, I don't know why I'm wrestling. Why do I feel bad about this? Why do I feel guilty? Why do I feel like I got to stop doing this and stop doing that? It's because the law has been etched in your heart. And now you may not get it all together, but you better rest assured you are going to feel guilty when you break those laws. So the 10 is pushing them to get ready for the spirit. And this is where Paul says the law was a schoolmaster to point us to this moment. And so we are at this moment. And it says in Acts 2.1 that suddenly, as they were all gathered together on the day of Pentecost in one place, something happened on one accord. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. When Pentecost came, they were all on the same page. And I'm going to hit this a little deeper than I did Sunday, but God gave them 10 days to get things in order. 10 days to get some things figured out. See, whenever God has you in a waiting season, it's not that he's torturing you. He's giving you time to get things in order. So the question becomes, if you've been waiting, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I said on Sunday, waiting is not like with your arms crossed, crossed saying, okay, God, do it when you're going to do it. The word wait in Hebrew is the same word that is used as waiting or being a waiter. So it means that in the process of your wait, you are serving God and making his agenda happen. You are holding a tray for God. And when God sees somebody renewing or holding a tray, he has a way of renewing their strength. I've never seen somebody serve with a pure heart and ever run out of strength. Strength is given to those that are making God's agenda happen. So he is giving them 10 days to get some stuff in order. I wonder in your weight, what does God have you getting in order? I say this all the time. People should be able to tell where you're going by what you're working on. So when somebody says, man, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, I don't get caught up in what they say. I get caught up in what they're doing because your actions will always point to where you're headed. If you're not doing nothing, then nothing is what your future will look like. So he gave them 10 days to, to, to get things in order and they are in the upper room. And this is not the first time they've been in the upper room. This room is very familiar. This room is kind of hard to be in. Have you ever had to sit in a room that belonged to somebody that you really loved? And they're not with you no more? Have you ever had to go over grandmother's house or, or your mother's house and just sit there? Sometimes it's because somebody took over the house or sometimes it's just to clean out the house. And it's not just houses. Sometimes it could be a vacation spot or a restaurant that you and your ex used to go to. And there's something about the room that has good memories and bad memories. The upper room was a place full of memories, some good. This is where Jesus washed feet. This is where Jesus broke bread. Some bad. This is where Jesus would be betrayed. This is where Judas would run quickly. There's all kinds of memories in this place. I told you this is the place where Jesus washed feet. And if we go backwards a little bit, to the book of John, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this. John chapter 13, it says, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour was coming. He knew his hour was coming. Oh, that's so powerful. Because when you're in tune with God, 
There's something about your moment that you can feel coming. You can't put it into words, but you can feel your moment is coming. It's like Elizabeth's kick in her stomach. There's something about your hour coming that you can feel. Feel and you know that this is the moment that God has been prepared. This is what all the studying was for. This is what keeping myself was for. This is what all that reading was for. This is what all that serving was for. There's something about knowing your hour is coming. How many can sense this evening in house and online that God is setting you up for your hour? He was feeling his hour was coming, that he should depart out of this world to the Father. He was sensing that he was about to go to another level. It does not say he was sensing that he was about to go to the cross. That's what most of us would sense. We would get more focused on the pain than the promotion. And you must understand, every promotion is preceded with pain. And most people get so focused on the pain that comes before the promotion that they back out of the promotion because they don't want to hurt. He was sensing his hour was coming. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. One thing about Jesus is no matter what they did, denied him, betrayed him, cussed, hung out with his haters, he never stopped loving them. And that's the beauty of God. Is no matter what you do or where you've been, God never stops loving you. He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father gave all things to his hand, that he was come from God, and he went, from, went to God, he rises from supper. He laid aside his garment. He took his towel and girded himself. Look at how Jesus is showing us how to know we're ready for the hour. He only has a little bit of time left on earth. You would think there's so many other things he could be doing. But what does he do? He gets down on his knees and washes feet. The towel represents his agenda. He takes off his agenda and starts serving his people. This is not what most would do, but that's why we're not like Jesus. And this is why most never get a chance to experience their hour. He senses it's his hour. So he takes off his agenda. He takes off his towel after supper. The reason this is important is because Jewish tradition was that you would get your feet washed before supper. They would say scriptures like blessed or how beautiful are the feet of those that carry the gospel of peace. Your feet would be dirty from your journey. They didn't have Nikes and concrete roads. They had sandals and dusty roads. So to not wash somebody's feet when they come into your house was a form of disrespect. So they would wash the feet because the feet represented your walk and the dirt represented the, what you've accumulated in your journey. And I always said, why did Jesus wait till after supper? And I think it was because he was giving them a chance to do it. See, sometimes God will wait to move because he's really giving you a chance to be the one to move. So he sits back and he waits and then finally he does it and he goes down, he pours water into a basin and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Look at Jesus showing us that when you're really in your hour, you don't just serve, but you look for the dirtiest part of the body and go after it. I mean, people that come in and say, I'm a minister, I'm a singer, I do this, I do that. Very few people come in and say, what's the dirtiest part of the church? What's the part of the church that's the hardest to get volunteers to do? Put me there. 
Because the thing about that is when you go for the dirtiest part of the body, the only place you can go from there is up. And what I found is that when most people go for the shoulders or the head, they burn out because they think they're above the feet. And so when you think that you're above the feet, what happens is you go from place to place not realizing that everybody that's at the top started at the feet. And so Jesus went for the feet and he started washing their feet and he gave them an order. He said, this do one to another. What he's doing is he's showing them how to keep the team together. He's showing them how to stay on, on one accord. He's showing them how to keep the unity. And when I'm serving you, here's the thing. I'm never competing with you. When I'm serving you, I'm not competing with you. I'm trying to figure out how do I complete you. There's nothing worse than relationships or teams that are constantly competing with each other rather than trying to complete each other. Because when you compete, guess what? Somebody wins. But whoever wins often wins only to stand alone. So what do I gain by winning if I'm all by myself? It's been said what is it to win the battle only to win the war? I remember counseling this couple and each one was so bent on their view being right. And I finally stepped back and I said, is your point or proving your point worth all of God's promises? Because that's what happens when we compete. My point becomes more important than my promise. So being right is what I'm all about. Even if being right leaves me all alone. So Jesus is showing them how to keep it. Keep it together. 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 That's what he's trying to teach them, how to keep it together. And when he got up, he would go back to the table with them. And he would break bread with them. And he would say this statement, one of you will betray me. Now, we know who the one that would betray him was. It was Judas. Judas would be the one to betray him. And Jesus knew Judas would be the one to betray him. And here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus picked his betrayer. You know you're ready for purpose when you can put your feelings to the side and pick the best person for the job. And Jesus was so focused on his purpose that when it came, when push came to shove, he called Peter Satan and Judas friend. Are you so mature to get to where God wants to take you that you will call your friends Satan sometimes and you will call your enemies friends? When you're hungry for your purpose, your whole perspective shifts. The reason Jesus called Peter Judas or Peter Satan is because Peter was trying to comfort Jesus when purpose is not a comforting situation. I don't need people telling me to take a break. My body will shut down and I'll know I need to take a break. I need people to say, keep going. Get up. You can do it. Like if a boxer's down in the corner and they're counting to 10, does the boxer need a coach to say, take a break, take as long as you need, buddy? Or does the boxer need somebody to say, get your tail up. You train too hard for this moment. You've thrown all of your life into this moment. There is no turning 
back. If you lose, you're not going to want to wake up tomorrow. If you lose, people are going to laugh at you. If you lose, people are going to talk about you. If you lose, you're going to go back to where you started and where I found you. You need some people that will speak life into you and say, keep going. You've got more in you. You are tougher than this. You are stronger than this. You are built from a different stock. You can survive this. You can beat this. And ultimately, God would have never put it on you if you weren't strong enough to go through it. Amen. Jesus wanted his purpose. That's what it comes down to is his purpose. People see me serve my spiritual father, but what they, they don't see is me getting in town a day early and ironing his clothes. What they don't see is when he gets done preaching, I'm running around to get water and ice packs to ice his swollen feet. That's what nobody sees. Because the thing about relationships and the thing about God is growth and strength are always measured by how low will you go to serve. And so Jesus... After going low, said, one of you is going to betray me. And Jesus picked his betrayer, the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot was his name. And it says that when Jesus said this, everybody looked at John and said, who is the one? Who is the one? Because John was the closest to Jesus. So he said, who's the one? And he said to Judas, what you are going to do, do it quickly. See, sometimes when you've been in a season that's been dragging out, whether it's somebody that wants to leave you or a job that wants to let you go, sometimes you just need to have the courage to say, do what you're going to do quickly. If you're going to leave me, leave me. If you want out, then walk out. If you want to fire me, then fire me. If you don't want to be my friend, then don't be my friend. But don't waste another decade of my life. Don't waste another 20 years of my life. If you don't want to be with me, then, then don't let the door hit you on your way out. Because I am good all by myself. I am built for this. And I know at the end of the day, if everybody leaves me, I got God with me. And as long as I got God with me, I will be okay. I will recover. I will rebound. I may be down for a season, but with God, I will never be out. Amen. And Judas leaves, and the disciples start whispering, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? Because the thing I learned from preaching years ago, a good Judas message, a good Judas message, I don't know if tonight's going to be a good one, but a good Judas message often convicts the whole room. And the only ones that aren't convicted from a Judas message are Judases themselves. They do what they're going to do quickly. So, so, so what was the thing about Judas that made him so destructive? It was more than just the kiss on the cheek in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas was a mindset. Judas was a mentality. And here's the thing with Judas. Judas always caused division. Division. And Jesus said what? A house that's divided can't stand. Judas is always caused division because the devil divides your blessings. God is not in the business of division. God is in the business of multiplication. The Bible says that God said to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Concerning Satan, a house divided against itself. Can't stand. So when God is moving, there's always multiplication. When division is happening, there is always a devil or a Judas. So how do you identify? This is all going to come full circle to Acts 2.1. How do you identify a Judas? How do you identify? Because the Bible uses this word discernment all the time. 
It's an old school word. New school churches don't usually use those kind of words like spiritual discernment. But discernment is when the Holy Spirit begins to show you that something's not right. And sometimes you can't always put it into words, but your discernment kicks in and you say, you know, there's something about this. And the way discernment kicks in is when you have enough information or the way it kicks in effectively is when you have enough information to identify what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. So how do you identify a Judas? Number one, Judas always connects with your enemies. When somebody is really for you, anybody that is not for you, they disconnect from. You should see my Instagram. The minute I even think that somebody is off with somebody I don't, that I care about, my followers start to dwindle. Or the people I follow, that is, start to dwindle. I'm so crazy about being loyal that I will unfollow you if you hurt somebody that I love. Because I never want people to see me as a Judas. Judas always connects with your enemy. The question is, how can somebody hate you so much and love your friend? For two to walk together, they must agree. If we're really connected, then they should hate you because they hate me. I'm kind of curious, what is it about you that makes them hate me and love you? So Judas is always connect to your enemies. Number two, Judas's always challenge motives. The connecting to your enemies. Judas was the one that connected to the Roman guards and sold Jesus out for some money. He was connected to the ones that were against Jesus. Judas's challenge pure Motus, when that woman busted the alabaster box of very expensive oil on Jesus' feet, it was Judas that spoke up and said, could we not use this money for the poor? And it says in parentheses, not that he even cared for the poor. He just controlled the bag. And he was a thief. But Judas's will always challenge pure motives. Watch out when you know that something is pure, but somebody always has something to say. Judas always challenges pure motives, and Judas has a way of wrapping it in religious talk. Always know this. The devil knows the Bible better than anybody in this room. Better than any preacher in the world. It's how he was able to go toe for toe or toe for toe, yeah, with Jesus in the wilderness. Not with opinions, but the word. Has not God said? He knows the word. He was with God before the fall. He was one of the third most powerful angels. He was the worship leader in heaven. And I always tell people, whatever you sing is pointing worship in some direction. And the way Satan kind of flicks off God is getting God's children to sing his music. It's his way of saying, I'm still a worship leader. But look at how I steal the praise to you and have them talking about everything your book is about and against. Satan knows the word and he challenges pure motives and wraps it up with religious talk. Like, Couldn't we use that money to feed the poor? Number three, Judas causes discord. When he made that statement about the woman busting the box, he was whispering with the team. And what he was doing was he was getting the team's chemistry off. And he was causing discord in the moment. 
chemistry is everything. Because here's the thing. When the apostles go out to start the church into the world, Jerusalem will kind of be an easier battle for them because they at least have a foundation of God. They'll get tithing because they tithe to the temple. They had ceremonies. They had the feasts of, of weeks and things like that and Passover. They, they, you know, they would battle giving and all that kind of stuff. But when they start going out to those Gentiles in Corinth, they are going to have to be on one accord. Because the thing about Judas is, is Judas has a way of finding the weakest link in the chain to break it. As a pastor, I always know what my, what my and who my weak links are. And I always watch how all the Judases draw to them to pray for them. If you don't know your weak links, then you will be caught off guard when the chain snaps. So Judas is always causing discord. Judas is careless with secrets. Watch out for people that always share people's secrets. Oh, did you hear? You know, they were telling me. If they were telling you, then why are you telling me? They're careless with secrets and they can't be trusted. And it's like when you hear somebody was told a secret, the first thing in you says, oh, Lord. They're careless. They can't be trusted with confidential information. Gethsemane was a secret place to Jesus. It was so secret. And I've taught this through the years that you got to really get that Jesus was so low key. He wasn't grand like most preachers today. He was very, he wouldn't be the guy trying to go viral all the time and saying outlandish stuff just so that he could get a couple thousand clicks. That was not Jesus. Jesus was so low key that they didn't even know what he looked like. They needed Judas to identify him. You would think that somebody like Jesus that has 20,000 people, 5,000 men, not including women and children, you would think somebody like Jesus would, would have a reputation. You would know him if you saw him. But Jesus was the guy that often did things and said, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody I did this. Don't tell nobody what you saw. Don't tell nobody what I revealed to you. Gethsemane was his secret place where he went to pray and get refreshed. And Judas was so careless with secrets that for a little bit of money, he took people and took guards to Jesus' secret place that he had the privilege to know about because he was on Jesus' team. Watch out for people that are just careless with secrets. I said this Sunday, I don't care what somebody's secret is. They could tell me, man, you know. I murdered her. <laughs> I murdered him. They're buried in the backyard under the mulberry tree. And the world is never going to hear where they're buried. Because if it's going to come out, it's not going to come out from me. A husband can tell me something. A wife can tell me something. I am going to die with your secrets because the world is full of people that will repeat what you tell, but you will be lucky if you can die one day and say you have at least one or two people that would never share not one thing you told them. And I've learned specifically from men, it's hard to get men to be vulnerable it's hard to get men to open up because they're afraid of what you're going to think once I tell you this. Or they're afraid that what if what I tell you gets out? And to have a secret place that I can get anything off of my chest, that's worth more than any amount of money to me. So when God begins to open doors, you have to hold on to people's Secrets, because it's what gives you credibility when you're trying to be used by God. That is, Judas was careless with secrets. And Judas 
Your Judas is, they can't handle losing. They cannot handle things not going as they have planned. Judas was so bad at losing that when he finally realized he lost, he killed himself. Peter was just as wrong. Peter denied God. Arguably, the Bible, if we're going by the Bible, Peter's sin was worse than Judas's sin. Denying your faith is the worst sin you can commit. It's worse than adultery. It's worse than fornication. It's worse than getting high. It's even worse than murder. I know it's crazy, but God says that's the only thing that will make, you de make me deny you before my father is if you deny me before people. Anything else, you can truly repent and be forgiven. Hitler could have repented and been forgiven. Jeffrey Dahmer could have repented and been forgiven. I could keep naming names. Repent and be forgiven. But the Bible says the one thing you cannot be forgiven of is denying your faith. Judah could have said, my bad. And I read a lot of books, and there's a book called The Book of Judas. Some argue against, you know, whether or not it should be a canon. There's other gospels that didn't get added in. And one thing about The Book of Judas is it actually says that Judas was not even trying to betray Jesus. He was actually trying to set Jesus up because he was saying, I'm getting tired of waiting. I want to put Jesus in a place where he shows what the kingdom can do. Now... You can pick and choose whether or not you want to believe that. I don't, but it's, it's a thought. But after all of that, all he would have had to do is say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Peter committed a worse sin, but he kept fighting. You know you have a Judas in your life when they can't handle a losing season. And when they leave your life quickly, stop chasing them. All the Bible says in 1 John 2, 19, one of my favorite verses, they went out from us because they were not of us. Because if they had been of us, they would have never been able to leave but would have stayed. Everybody that has left your life, left your life because their season was up. And you tried to hold on to them and you tried to give them your body and you tried to give them your money and you tried to give them more time and you tried to let them have your car as much as they wanted it. And you tried to let them tap into whatever you had and you signed for things you should have never signed for for them. And everything you did didn't work. Why? Because their season was up. And one thing somebody told me a long time ago, the one thing you cannot fix is dead. So your Judases leave because they can't handle losing. And lastly, their commitment is fickle. What you're going to do, Jesus said, do it quickly. They have no strength. They have no, the Bible says, having done all to stand, they have no standing power. They go from relationship to relationship. They go from job to job. They go from church to church. Because their commitment is fickle. And they're able to leave things that they say they love quickly. Watch out when you start connecting to people that have fickle commitment. Because in order for two to walk together, they got to agree. And if you're walking with a Judas, people are going to think that you are a Judas. The Bible says, choose ye this day who you will serve. There are moments in life that you have to make tough decisions. Because I think the best illustration is this with Jonah. When you connect to a Judas or a Jonah, somebody that's out of God's will, you have to be prepared for your ship to sink because of who you're connected to. If you connect to a Jonah, 
then you can't be upset when you've been swallowed by a whale too. The sailor's ship was falling apart, not because they did anything wrong, but when they got rid of Jonah, you know what it says they did? They started worshiping. And it shows me that Jonah was, was not just wrecking their ship. Jonah's presence was hindering their worship. And I wonder whose ship is ready to go down and whose worship is ready to go to a next level if you could ever just get rid of Jonah or the other J, Judas. You might just see your next level come into your life. Jesus could not go to the next level until Judas departed. What is the next level of your life? That God is saying, you cannot, like the rockets that go into space, you cannot go to the next dimension till these booster Judases fall off. Judas was breaking the rhythm. They could not be on one accord until Judas was gone. He was breaking the rhythm. To be on one accord, I said Sunday, means that you have rhythm. One accord. An accord is a, a musical term. It describes a, a harmony or a rhythm. As long as Judas was there, they were 12 notes with no rhythm. Judas was breaking the rhythm. And everything that God does has a rhythm. He told Moses, build the tabernacle according to the pattern that I show you, according to the rhythm. Whatever God does has a rhythm. <laughs> Judas. Your life. Your life is supposed to have a rhythm. But because of who you got in your life, the Bible says that love is one of the rhythms of the church. And Paul said, if you do not have love in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, you are a clanging brass, a tinkling cymbal. He says, the sound is off when the rhythm is off. Judas was breaking the rhythm. The rhythm. Does your life have a rhythm? Or is your life all over the place? Oh, how blessed it is when the brethren dwell together in unity the Bible says, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard. It goes on to say, as the dew of Hermon, it is there that the Lord commands a blessing. Whenever there is unity, whenever there is harmony, whenever there is one accord, it is there that God always commands a blessing. See, now we're getting to the point. When he left for 10 days, he was giving them 10 days to find a rhythm. Up until this point, they had no rhythm. When will the kingdom come? You still don't have a rhythm. You're asking me questions that you shouldn't be asking me. And remember when they asked Jesus, when will the end days be? Jesus said, I don't even know. My father knows that information. I'm okay with not knowing because that's our rhythm. If you're asking me things that you have no business asking me, it's clear you don't have a rhythm. So I'm giving you 10 days to find a rhythm. 
10 days, I'm setting the stage. I'm bringing people from all over the world to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks. There will be people from Asia. There will be people from Europe. There will be people from Africa. There will be people from Saudi Arabia. There will be people from Turkey. There will be people from India. People are coming from all over the Mediterranean and beyond. I am setting the stage for you. See, you have to understand that even when you can't sense God or trace God, God, God is always setting a stage for you. God is always getting things ready for you. When I started this church with three people, I didn't realize when I had the three people that fast forward 15 years years, God was going to be setting a stage in Owings Mills. I had no idea I was going to meet you. I had no idea I was going to meet you. I had no idea the people that were watching online were going to watch online. But when I was just getting started and my car got repossessed on two occasions and my house got taken because I was feeding God's people and, and not paying my bills, I had no idea that in that process of waiting, God was setting a stage even when my world was falling apart. Part. It doesn't matter how bad your world may feel or seem, God is setting a stage for you. The Bible says he is preparing a table for you. So don't ever think that when everything is crumbling, that God is sitting back and resting. God loves you too much for that. He's setting the man up. He's setting the woman up. He's setting the job up. He's setting the doctor's office up. He's setting the career up. He's setting the money up. He is setting setting the stage for your moment. The only question is, what are you doing in the wait? Thank you, Lord, for not giving it to me too early. Thank you, Lord, for not giving it to me when my life was like that. When I was in a marriage, that was like that. When I was going to a job, that was like that. When my finances were like that. When my credit was 320 <laughs> and like that. Isn't it good to know that God loves us too much to give it to us early? But he gives it right on time, he was giving them 10 days to find the rhythm. Your life has a rhythm. Stop dating people for everything outside of whether or not they are your rhythm. We get caught up on careers. We get caught up on looks. Do they have your rhythm? Rhythm. Do they raise children and parent like you? Are their views of marriage what you view marriage being? What's their relationship with their in-laws? All that kind of stuff. You're not discovering whether or not you're fit. You're discovering whether or not you have the right rhythm together. God told Jacob, I want everything in your house circumcised. Why? Because everything in your house has to have unity. Because if anything's in your house that does not have unity, God's glory will not come. What is your rhythm? They have to get on one accord. Because they're going to have to teach the world how to be on one accord. They are going to have to teach families how to be on one accord. And it's been said that you can teach what you know, but you will always reproduce what you are. I've seen amazing preachers, and I've met a lot of them, with bad ministries. And it's because, yes, they know the word, and yes, they know the Greek and the Hebrew. And you're going to know, too, after the dig. Shameless plug. <laughs> but they know how to articulate, but they don't know how to walk with God. And when you don't know how to walk with God, you have a church full of smart people, biblically, but powerless people spiritually. So they have to get this together. And God gives them 10 days 
to get this together. He's been praying for this for a long time. Remember in John 17, he said, Father, I pray that they would be one as me and you are one. He's been praying for this. The world's going to hate them so much. They will all be crucified at some point. Paul will be beheaded. Peter will be hung on a cross upside down. Thomas will be persecuted in India. They will all die horrible deaths. But I pray that in the midst of a world that hates them, that they would at least love each other. My team will tell you, I, I can't control what everybody does, but the people around me, I will get up in their grill if anybody breaks my chemistry. There's nothing worse than somebody changing the temperature in your room. When my daughter came to, to live with us when she was younger and we took her in, I used to get so mad because I'd wake up sweating and in the middle of the night she would be playing with the temperature. And we had to have a talk that that is against the rules. You do not touch. She ended up winning. I got an air conditioned in the room. <laughs> kind of how it always ended up working. But there's nothing worse than somebody controlling your temperature with their attitudes, controlling your temperature with their lifestyle, controlling your temperature with their smart remarks. That's what Judas is good at. Judas is good at changing the temperature. And Jesus' prayer was that in a hard world, they wouldn't have to battle with each other. That one another would be a safe place. That if they could ever get off, <laughs> I, I remember telling, I was, my, my, when I preached at the Potter's house a couple months ago, that was like my dream. I have a picture from when I was a young boy. I just started the church. I literally stood on the stage and I, I was just looking out and somebody caught the picture from behind me. And I told the guy that gave us the tour, I said, one day I'm going to preach here. And he said, how many people do you have? I said, like 15 members. And I was 26. And I, he said, yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that. I'm good friends with the guy to this day. But when I got up there, I wanted to say, what'd you say? <laughs> but I was so nervous because my spiritual father, uh, Bishop J.C., called me on Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. and said, I want you to teach for me tomorrow night. I had no notice. I had nothing prepared. And this was my biggest moment and I had to immediately start packing. My flight was for 6.30 in the morning to get to Dallas, to unpack, all of this kind of stuff. I went to the church. I wanted to walk on the stage. I wanted to see where my teleprompter would be. I wanted to feel it out because I didn't want to get up there blindsided with a new experience because I sat on the stage before, but walking on it and preaching on it was different. I, I had to rush. I was rushing to pack, all this kind of stuff. And I, I get to Dallas and I'm like, yeah, this is happening. And I called him and he said, you will be fine if you stop making it about yourself and give the people Jesus. Amen. Amen. And it was something about it that just said, all right, God, you put me here. I'm just going to stand up there and tell people how much I love you. Amen. And whatever happens, happens. And it was a life changing moment. But it happened just like that. And I'm so glad that God didn't give it to me before I was ready for it. When suddenly hits, suddenly hits. And the question will be, what have you done to get ready for it? Jesus has been praying for them to get ready. He is gone now. The test paper has been given. What you do with what I've taught you over three and a half years is on you. But suddenly it's coming. Suddenly it's coming. The hurricane is coming. The tsunami is coming. What are your levees like? Are you getting ready? Because when the blessing comes as a wave, 
it is either going to be structurally supported by your levies or the thing that God sent to bless you is going to be the curse that drowns you. Suddenly. Suddenly. Can I get 10 more minutes? Are y'all enjoying this? Yes. Okay. So, so suddenly, 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 suddenly it happens. They have chosen Matthias. They have, you know, he's not the guy. God's going to pick Saul. You know, Saul is God's guy, like David, you know, and King Saul. You know, Saul, Paul is going to be God's guy. But they choose Matthias because they wanted somebody that saw Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. So we're at least in the meantime going to pick somebody that was there. <laughs> Don't ever pick somebody that's missed all the moments. I've learned that as a leader. Sometimes you may take a chance on people that have always been in position, but don't ever pick somebody that has missed the moments. If you miss the life and you miss the death and you miss the resurrection, then I'm going to miss picking you. <laughs> because being in position was all they were looking for. I just want somebody that's solid because we can at least be on one accord and then God can replace him later. And so they did it, and the Spirit came in, and it happened suddenly, and it was a great wind, a mighty wind. They saw cloven tongues like as fire, not fire, but like as fire, and they were changed in a moment, because until Judas was gone, they could never be on one accord. And until Judas was gone, they could never be ready for their suddenly. What is the Judas that has left your life recently that you have been crying about, but God is saying it is ready, set, go for you to start getting things in order? I have learned that when Judas is leave, that is the shotgun going off for me to run. I don't have time to sit around and cry and moan and weep. No, 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 no. Judas leaving does not mean the show stops and I get a moment to grieve. John Maxwell said it like this. A good leader only gets 48 hours to mourn. Because anything past 48 hours and you begin losing what you've built. So it's going to hurt. And you're going to cry and it's going to sting. But when Judas left, the shotgun went off and your suddenly is coming because God would not have taken Judas away unless suddenly was on the way. So what are you doing to become a better man? What are you doing to become a better woman? What are you doing to learn how to handle money? What are you doing to get your emotions in order? What are you doing to stretch your mindset? What rooms are you trying to get into so that you could become better? Because the wave is coming. And next week, we're going to talk about the opposition that was waiting for them as soon as they came out. Because now they have left the room and they have the mandate to create rooms. Because whenever God puts you in a room, it is up to you to create rooms. It is kind of like joining a church. The Bible says when we give, we put it to the storehouse. Why? Because if I don't keep loading the storehouse, then the next me that comes in the building may not get fed. So I give because other people's giving is the reason that I had somewhere to go. So when I sacrifice and when I serve, what I'm doing is I'm making it possible for the next me to have food in the refrigerator. So when God gives you a moment, it is up to you to now go out and make that moment happen for others. And Peter will go out, and I said Sunday, when you go into a good room, your whole language changes. 
I know this was a good room because it says they went out and people from all over the world were there in verse 9. You can read it. Medes, Egypt, you, people, Europe, people from all over were there. But every person heard them speaking in their own language. How are we going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth? And here's the catch. They would say things like, who are these Galileans? Because in Galilee, they had a very poor English. We would call it poor English. They had poor Hebrew, I mean. It was a very poor, it was like, you know, I grew up in, in South Baltimore, and if I let it go, you'll hear slang come out of my mouth. And what does that mean? So I have to take my time when I talk, or that will come out. That's what Galilee language was like. The Hebrew people from outside of Galilee struggled to understand it. How do these unlearned fishermen with bad Hebrew speak so well that the whole world hears them clearly? It is because when you get your suddenly, people that would never hear you before start to hear you clearer than ever. When you get your suddenly, God begins to give you the language for every single room that you're going to enter into. It's been said that God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. I think that part of that is a stupid saying because that means that God only chooses dumb people. And many here are far from dumb. But part of it is true. God can call the unqualified and qualify them. All you have to do is find your room. And you cannot get into your room as long as you're holding hands with Judas. Do you love your room enough to slap Judas' hand away tonight? Because as long as he is connected, you're not ready for the room. And they have been gathered. What we said in the beginning. They have been gathered. Gathered on the 40th day with Jesus. Gathered in the upper room. They, 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 they have been, the 12. They have been gathered. But it says that when they went out, the people that were gathering outside of the moment had something to say. And it says, and they said amongst themselves, what are they drinking? <clears throat> they said amongst themselves. See, this is the worst conversation to have. It is so bad to try to get understanding about a moment from people that miss the moment. They said amongst themselves, so they weren't in the upper room. And whenever you have conversations about a moment with people that miss the moment, they're always going to tack their agenda to it. You, you know they're just drinking. And I love what Peter says. You know we ain't drinking. It's nine in the morning. It is nine in the morning. We are not, some people do, but we are not <laughs> drinking at nine in the morning. And he lifted up his voice over them. Why? Because the room amplified Peter's voice. The greatest challenge you are going to have in life is finding your room and eliminating your Judases. And here's the scary part. Jesus had 12 disciples and one was a Judas. This was Jesus. Jesus who could do, do no wrong, Jesus. And even Jesus picked bad. What if I were to tell you that if you're lucky and we're not Jesus, what if I were to tell you that one out of every 12 people that come into your life is probably a Judas? 
let's just start one. I don't want anybody to get it. Well, <laughs> dang. But when you start walking in your purpose, that's how you start to look at things. Who is the one that is sent by Satan to nail me to a cross? And the reason you have to identify your Judas is who connects with your enemies, who challenges pure motives, who causes discord, who's careless with secrets, who can't handle losing, whose commitment is fickle, is because if you can't identify them, they will be the one that sticks the blade in your side. So as we continue next week in finding our room, tonight the challenge is what, are, what is God asking us to let go of? Who is God asking us to let go of? What has gone wrong in this season? Because it is all the setup for our suddenly that is about to take place. Do you, and he sensed his hour was coming. Do you sense that your suddenly is coming? Because if you can sense that the hour is coming, that means you don't get the rest. You don't get the walk. You need to pick up your pan and run like you've never ran before. Because when this moment hits, it is going to hit. Because God would not have allowed it to go wrong if he was not setting you up for his glory to fall.